This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. It really is becoming a world where if you have the skill, if you have the talent, and you've worked at it much more than the other guy, the other lady, and you really bring extreme value, you're going to make a hell of a lot more money across your lifetime. My guest today is Michael Solomon. He's the co-founder of 10X Management, the world's first tech talent agency. As that probably implies to you, he matches top tech talent with those that need it. And today we jump into his new book, Game Changer, How to Be 10X in the Talent Economy. Because as I lay out from the beginning, if you've got it in you, then well, you're probably already taken care of. But how do you get it? How do you set about a course for your lifetime to be one of those people that have the chance to be 10X. Without any further delay, let's jump right into my conversation with Michael Solomon and grab a little of that 10X education. I have a sneaky suspicion you have a kind of an eclectic entrepreneurial background, not a sneaky suspicion. I kind of know, but I want to know you give me an age, a teen age, a moment where something happened, a pivot, some experience. I don't know, 13, 15, 16, 18, whatever it was, what was the magic moment? And maybe it was in your twenties. I don't know. What was the moment where things changed and you were not just a desk jockey sitting somewhere shuffling paper for somebody? I think that it goes actually back to early adolescence. I was fortunate enough to go to private school in Manhattan. I was, economically speaking, a very comfortably middle-class kid. But in private school in Manhattan, put me sort of at the very bottom of the economic rung. I was sort of had the least extravagant lifestyle above the scholarship kids. I think that that sort of positioned me for wanting at that stage in my life for money and success to be a big part of what was going to happen in the future. That sort of got ingrained. And that went from that feeling to wanting to start businesses by the time I was probably 12. I mean, I was selling chocolate covered bananas on the street by the time I was 13. We were doing party promotion by the time I was 14. We did a fake ID business by the time I was 16. And then t-shirts and we tried to open a pool hall when I was 19 and came very close to that. And it's sort of been this constant progression. I think what came later in life, which was a little surprising with hindsight, was sort of putting the rest of the things that mean a lot in life into the mix. I spend a ton of time now working on nonprofit things and things that make me fulfilled and feel whole that are not about making money. And I think I probably actually spend as much time doing that as I do working on making money. And I never became the giant financial success at the level that I was imagining as a child, but it didn't matter because I have a much more fulfilling life than I think I would had I had that path. Yeah. And I wasn't necessarily going down the path of saying, what's your net worth? I wasn't going there by any stretch. Just trying to get at what's those moments. Well, let me keep it at fake IDs for a moment. It spurs in a memory in me. I know at age 16, I had a fake ID. It was actually not a fake ID. It was a real Maryland driver's license. I lived in Virginia. I don't know how I got it. I still remember the guy's name on it, John Edwin's. And I used this for like- You probably even remember his birth date if I had to guess. I remember his street address. I won't say it. (laughs) I used that sucker at 7-Eleven and whatnot forever. This is back in the day. You know, we're probably closer in age. I don't think today kids, you know, my nephew probably go straight to jail now if he did this kind of stuff. But take me to the fake ID business Look, if you're putting that kind of business together, I mean, even when we were younger, we could have got in decent trouble if they really wanted to pinch us. 
Yeah. I mean, one of the brilliant things about that business that I am loath to share, but it's amusing enough that it's worthwhile, is I was not such a great student and academia wasn't my jam. The result of that was we actually misspelled license on all of the fake IDs that we made. It was only a bouncer somewhere along the way that noticed it, which was pretty comical because many, many, many people laid eyes on it. Once we realized that, we concluded, you know what? No one notices this. This isn't a problem. Let's keep it that way. And if we ever get caught, we're going to say, clearly, this is a novelty item not intended for defrauding anyone or buying alcohol because we didn't even spell license correctly. That was sort of the first moment of pivot. We're going to make the most realistic fake IDs we possibly can to maybe that's not such a good idea. It was definitely a concern. We would hide the big board that we used to photograph people in front of so that our parents couldn't see it. Although at a certain point, they became aware of it and were not thrilled, but also somewhat permissive about it. They stoked the entrepreneurial spirit that was underneath it. Well, you now spurred me to a second memory that I must share. The way that I lost this fake ID was through a bouncer who looked at it and said, I know this is not you. I routed off everything on the ID. I knew everything because I know this is not you because I know this guy. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. That's, t- <laughs> that's terrible. I lost it at that moment in time. Well, listen, jump me up to something we kind of get a flavor. You already have got some risk taking in your blood as a teen. Jump me up in time, though, because eventually you start to, with your associate, Rishan, that's proper pronunciation, Rishan. That was perfect. You guys get into managing talent, specifically musical talent. How in the world did this start, pivot? What was the transition? What was the spark? Who did you meet? I want to know. Growing up in the 80s in New York, both of us going to private school put us in arm's length of many people whose parents were luminaries in the industry. And that was sort of the light bulb moment of we love music, we love music culture, we love all of that, but there's actually an industry here where you can work and make a living. There's all these attributes of that that were very appealing to me. I definitely didn't want to go to a job where I was going to have to wear a suit, and that was a big factor. The nightlife and going out and seeing bands all the time was a big factor. A lot of it was culture and lifestyle, and that's very appealing to somebody who's at that stage, we weren't even in college yet, but all through our college years. That was fantastic. In while we were doing research for this pool hall, spending a lot of our time in pool halls, in walks a friend of ours who brings in this beautiful young woman who I end up dating for four years. Turns out her mother is Bruce Springsteen's co-manager and her stepfather is his biographer, a well-known book author, Dave Marsh. That was where I really got exposed to the music industry and got to sort of have a very good inside look at what I didn't know at the time was perfection. The relationship that Springsteen has with his team and his management is the archetype, idealized, perfect example of what that relationship should look like. It looks more like family. Everybody involved is a 10Xer, which is a term that I'm going to use repeatedly. And these are the people, I mean, the term is generally used in technology for somebody who can write code 10 times faster or better than another person. But we use that term for people who just have EQ and IQ and are incredibly capable, arguably five or 10 times more capable than their peers. Springsteen himself is clearly hands down the first 10Xer I ever saw. Then as we looked around him and we saw his managers and his tour director and all of these other people and the musicians and the crew and everybody, we we sort of started to get an understanding of what this was. We didn't have a language for it yet. I'm going to keep you at a pause there for a second, because if somebody says, I've got some experience firsthand of seeing how Bruce Springsteen was a 10Xer, could provide essentially 10 times the value that maybe a mere mortal, I'm sure with in the music industry, he's a lot more than 10. What did you see up close? I mean, talk about the first meeting. Obviously, you had a chance to spend some time with him. What I saw, and I'll talk about him in a second, but what I saw was a mutual respect and admiration, a team of people that were working together seamlessly, and they'd been doing it for decades by the time that I had arrived on the scene. This was not new, but doing it with joy, doing it with precision. People, I mean, Bruce talks about it on his Broadway show about this magic trick that he has, and he really gets into it. It's not just him. It's all the people around him that had these magic tricks. 
the tour director, I would be somewhere on the road hanging out with a band member somewhere at a museum. Some gossipy thing would come up. The tour director, I would see him five minutes later, he would know about it always. It was like he had complete perfect pitch on everything that was going on with everybody on the road at all times. It was like a magic trick. And the managers and how they handled the label and how they handled the merchandise. And it was all so perfect. There was an element of me that was super lucky that I didn't realize this is not what it normally looks like because I might not have ever gone in that direction. We started brick wall management when we were 25 years old, which is 25 years ago next week, a week from today, actually. It was all in pursuit of this fantastical dream and this magic that existed. I'm not sure we ever achieved it at that level. Forget about the success of it, just the smoothness, the perfection of it. But it was a great archetype to go for. And I think that it's really shaped everything that we've done since then, because we're just chasing this idealized version. Part of what is so great about that is when you're pursuing that level of excellence and you're open to the feedback and you see how this can be, you all of a sudden can go for things that you wouldn't have otherwise thought possible. That aspirational element is so important. How much of getting that aspirational element, and I've seen this in my world from being around some really high level traders early in my career, because ultimately if you can be around somebody who's at this super high level, you have deep respect for them, but you still see they're human and they can put their pants on There's an aspirational thing that happens when you're exposed to the top. And I assume that happened with you and Springsteen. Yeah, I mean, completely. It was, I want to be this good at anything. It sort of didn't matter what it was. And the other part of what was so beautiful about particularly the management relationship with Bruce and management relationships in general, and this is carried forth in every single thing we've done in our careers, is the element of skin in the game. They're in it together. They're partners. John Landau and Barbara Carr, as it relates to Bruce Springsteen, can't make money unless Bruce Springsteen is making money. Now, that's obviously not a hard thing to do with somebody like Bruce, but the nature of the relationship is when you win, we win, and when you lose, we lose. Our wagons are hitched. There's something elegant and simple and beautiful about that business model that has been such a driving force in my life. My parents work in nonprofit. They're always very sensitive and careful about conflict of interest. I think people in that industry take that way more seriously, certainly than in many other industries, including politics. Always love the idea that there was not a conflict of interest in the business model of what we did with management. Fast forward to the music industry collapsing, and I hope it's okay that I'm jumping to this. When we had our big sort of innovative moment of saying, wait, the new rock stars are technology talent. Why don't we try a talent agency for tech talent? That was such a great thing to bring with us was this idea that we can be people in that industry who are currently being exploited. The reaction from the talent was, where have you been? Thank goodness. I mean, that was amazing. Okay. I'm not going to let you escape from music just yet because I think it's going to inform some things. But as you talk about- And we haven't escaped from music just yet because we still have that. If we talk about Bruce and you talk about the good things that you saw and some high level big picture things, kind of a community approach, a family approach, skin of the game, you've been around enough other acts to clearly see people go down an entirely different path, nowhere comparable or similar to Bruce. And I'm sure some of those people even made lots of money but there was something missing. I mean, you can make all the money in the world and if your life is terrible, that's not so much fun, huh? Yeah, we've seen a lot of that. It's something we call the sabotage impulse and we get into this also in the book. It's basically the people who don't wanna take responsibility for their role in things. They're not interested in feedback. They're not interested in accepting responsibility. They're only interested in using a blame thrower, if you will, where it's like everybody else's fault. One of the patterns that you see when you work in the music industry repeatedly is a young artist comes in, gets some representation, whether it's a manager, a lawyer, an agent, whoever it is who's guiding them, an a r person, they follow the guidance and it leads them where they want to go. 
then they start to have success and they literally have somebody or many somebody's in their ear every night telling them how great they are. The fans are, you changed my life, you saved my life. It immediately goes to their head. By the time they reach a certain level of success, they all of a sudden stop listening. They think everything is them. They don't want to hear the hard stuff. Ultimately, what they're left with is blaming everybody, firing people. It's the opposite of what you want. It's the opposite of what a 10Xer does. Often you see these people who their career arc is like a quick rise and then a quick fall or sometimes a quick rise and a slow fall. But it's the ones who are able to continue to sort of be analytical and look at the feedback they're getting and have the trusted people around them who will say, I don't think that's a good idea. Or what if we do this this way that are going to continue to rise or sustain at that level? And I think that's one of the things that Bruce is amazing at. Let me give you the shift. So the shift is, as we kind of lay this foundation, early teens, kind of got this entrepreneurial bug, go down that path. There's some serendipity. You find your way into meeting someone like Bruce Springsteen. And I would like to add here, I'm sure plenty of people through the random roundabout connections that you laid out to me. Lots of other people had those connections too. Probably didn't follow up like you and your partner did. So we go down this path and you explore the musical space. You rep talent in the music space. But then there's another pivot in your life. You somehow or another, and I want you to tell me how, you pivot from saying, wow, repping talent in the music space. What about repping talent in the coding space? Now, those two things don't seem remotely connected, but I'm sure you're going to tell me that once I understand the way you looked at it, they are pretty connected in a way. This is the theme of everything that we've learned is talent is talent. The definition of talent is changing and broadening. The theme of what we're driving at in these conversations is helping people, especially in corporate America, understand that the people who work for you, whether you're a CEO or you're a mid-level manager or you're a low-level manager, those people on your team, their talent, they are thinking of themselves as talent. They want to be treated as talent. Now, does that mean you have to pick out the green M&Ms for them? No, that's not what it's about. But if you want to get the most out of them, and more importantly, if you want to be able to hire the 10Xers, then you have to think about them in this context. What is the greatest talent in the world want? They want a place where they can thrive and grow and get feedback and get better, where they're valued and they feel valued. Not just their work is valued, but they're valued as human beings. And as much as everything I'm describing is very applicable to 10Xers, it's also equally applicable to Gen Z and to millennial. This is how they think of themselves. There's this constant, I'm sure you've heard about it a million times, push and pull between millennials and sort of people who are more our age who are like, these millennials are horrible, they're lazy, all of this stuff. They're just not realizing that there was a shift in how people think about themselves and how they want to be treated. And that's not just entitlement and spoiledness. It's just a different way of thinking about it. I want you to lay out a little bit of detail with an example that I'm thinking of from your work about the 10X mindset, the 10X, exactly what it is. I think you've got an example. I don't recall the exact company, but it was something to the effect that a particular company that you worked with or repped or whatnot had approximately, I think the number was 35, 33 employees, something like that. They were having trouble. They weren't getting what they wanted. The company was not moving forward. And if I'm not mistaken, you helped them to be introduced to three of what you would call 10Xers, the entire 30 plus staff essentially went by to other jobs and that company was able to use three people to replace 30. Is that a fair assessment? You've got it 100% correct. We never thought we would have such a literal example of 10X because it happens, but it's not quite this literal. The founder of this organization came to me and asked if we had people who could do this and I showed him a few of those profiles and he explained that his team, it had gotten bureaucratic, I think was the way he described it. And he felt that there was a need for a change. He knew their entire platform needed to be rebuilt. He said, all right, we didn't have this conversation. And then he came back a couple weeks later and he said, okay, I've laid off carefully and well without placement services and they've all got great jobs and don't worry about them. 33 of the 36 people. And he kept a few to keep sort of the lights on, if you will. These three guys, which eventually grew grew to a team of five or six, rebuilt the platforms from scratch in roughly a six-month time frame. By the time they were done, they had it running at 
incredibly fast speeds, the processing speed of like what Amazon does in terms of transactions. The team that we put in place was excited about everything they had done. The company, the founder was thrilled, but they got most excited about the speed of being able to process transactions because they were like, we completely nailed this. That is what can happen when you take the best and the brightest, you give them what they need, the resources they need, the time, the space. And by the way, this was probably now three, four years ago, they were all working remotely. They would occasionally travel in, but they were not all in one place. You mean there wasn't a boss or a company policy that said you had to show up every day and stand around the water cooler and hobnob with everybody? That wasn't part of the deal? Even before COVID, there were people who were thinking that, wow, why do I want the best person who's within a one hour drive of my office when I could have the best person for the job who may not even be within a five hour drive of the office or a five hour flight? It was a fantastic outcome. And when we started, we had no idea it was going to be such a great relationship, but it was ideal. And the people who worked on it were that great. Let me keep it at the mentioning the millennials and Gen Z and some other generation in there as well, too. But I'm thinking of a bell curve in my mind, and I'm thinking, okay, if we've got multiple generations that have this maybe higher sense of self-worth, there's still a basic statistical property going on where not everybody gets to be, as you just described, three that replace 33. Everyone can aspire to, everybody can improve. I'm not trying to say that. I'm not saying we all can't really raise it up. But do you think there's any, when you make these observations of people and groups and whatnot, are there any parts of some of the generations where their self-worth is too high compared to what they've done in order to get to be one of these 10 Xers? Meaning, is there a little bit of a too much ego thing taking place, whereas some of the 10 Xers that you're describing, they got the egos in check and they just work hard and they love to do it? Absolutely. I don't want to suggest that there aren't extremely entitled, inappropriately entitled millennials and Gen Zs and from every generation who just think they're better than they are. That's going to happen throughout. I just think that in order to get the best out of anybody from these generations or 10Xers, you want to create the environment where people can get better. So even if you're a 4Xer and you can become a 6Xer, in the example I'm using, if you can help that person become a third better than they are, you've done a great service to them. And certainly the outcomes you're trying to achieve just got a lot easier. It certainly exists. And then there's people who have the sabotage impulse that I was describing a minute ago. And the minute you spot that, get those people out of your organization because they're not going to learn. In order to learn, you have to have some level of humility. What's a great concrete example for the sabotage impulse that you see someone coming into the operation or someplace that you're working with and you see that person coming in where you just know immediately, this just isn't going to work. I'm sorry. So you often start to see it. We try and have gotten pretty good at spotting it even in an interview process. One of the things, and I have to thank our advisor from Enjoy the Work, who's taught us so many things for this technique, but one of the things that we do in interviews at this point is we'll pick a little argument with the person, not a heated thing, but just something to see how do they react when somebody disagrees with them? How do they take negative feedback? Part of what we do in, in our interview process is we play out scenarios where somebody made a mistake. Tell me about a time you made a mistake, you were wrong, you did something that you shouldn't have done or that really wasn't what the person you were working for was looking for. I can almost tell every time from how they tell that story whether they're going to have the sabotage impulse. I, of course, fail in certain instances, but it's pretty easy because the person who says, I did this and it was really my fault and I learned so much, but I regret it and I realize now that whatever it was, that's somebody who has the ability to see what their role is and learn from it. Conversely, the person who tells me, well, this happened, I did it wrong, but it wasn't really my fault, and it was this and it was that, they failed to understand the question, for one thing. If I give them a second opportunity to say, no, 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 I'm really looking for a time you made a mistake and you did something wrong, if they can't comfortably get there, that's a very big sign to me that this is somebody who's not going to be able to make it happen. I mean, I could give you countless examples of this kind of behavior. But part of what happens when you allow somebody like that in your organization is everybody around them is constantly ducking and covering because every mistake that that person made is going to get foisted 
on somebody else. I mean, I think we're seeing this in very high offices in our country right now where I could be wrong. I don't think there's been a moment, and I don't want to turn the conversation political, but I don't think there's been a moment in this presidency where he has said, I made a mistake. I wish I had acted faster. Nothing. Certainly in prior presidencies, there were moments of that. There were varying degrees on how often somebody was willing to admit that. But when somebody's completely unwilling to say, I played a role in an outcome that I didn't like, there's nothing to work with. Yeah. I mean, I see it all the time in untold numbers of examples. I specifically see it in social media conversations, regardless of the topic. You can just spot people. I think you used the cool phrase that I had never heard used a few minutes ago, the blame thrower. This is something that is not only we having a corona pandemic, there is a blame thrower pandemic across America right now, regardless of party, regardless of age. There's just a certain type of individual. I don't know what their exact percentage of the population is, but there's a certain type of individual that just doesn't seem to have this wake up joy feeling. Here's my gig. Okay. I wake up, got all kinds of different things I'm working on entrepreneurially, but what I'm searching for every damn day when I wake up is flow state. How many of the people that exist in our fine country don't have the foggiest clue what the flow state is? That, by the way, takes me right back to the conversation about remote work. People who do any kind of work that involves and has value of getting into a flow state from writers to people who code to anybody who has to do something that requires deep thought and concentration, by putting them in the wrong environment, you lose so much value of what they have. And I'll be very clear about what I mean about this. For a lot of software engineers who write code, it can take them one to two hours, sometimes even longer, to get into the flow state. And the flow state, for those not familiar with this, you're in the zone. You're working at multiple speeds of how well you normally work, both in terms of speed and quality. And you're just flying through your task in a sort of superhuman state. Everybody who takes somebody like that and puts them in an open office space where somebody comes over and taps them on the shoulder every 15 minutes, or they have to get up and go to a meeting, you're losing out on the benefit of when somebody gets into that. This is part of the reason we've been promoting remote work for the last seven years. Mahaley Chicksamahai. Come on, I want to hear you say it too. <laughs> I'm not even going to try it. I love positive psychology. I believe we quote him in the book, as I recall. I can't even go near trying to pronounce that it name. It took me a long time to figure that one out, how to say it. And now once I've got it, you just can't look at the letters. Because if you look at the letters, you're screwed. There's no way to say his name by looking at the letters. No, exactly. It's a lot of consonants all in a row, which is very hard to try and figure out how to pronounce anyway. Yeah. Is there any way from your perspective, as we talk about how important you explain a little bit of the flow state, talk about how important it is and distractions can destroy it. And I mentioned that maybe a lot of people don't even know what it is necessarily, or they've never really truly been in it. Is there a way that you can help people to understand? I mean, we can talk, we're talking about it right now, what it is, but getting people to really get into it. Is this something that you can learn? Are you born with it? Do you just keep experimenting and figure it out? What happens? I don't know that I actually know the answer to that question. When I think about myself, my day is filled of micro tasks. I'm rarely sitting down and doing the same thing for a long period of time. But I actually have noticed that even in my micro task, somewhat ADD way of working, I actually can get in a flow state doing a ton of small things quickly by just being focused on it. I think it comes with time. I think it comes with the 10,000 hours, if you will, and teaching it. I mean, I think the first thing about teaching it is create the environment where it's possible. Because it's not going to happen if you're constantly being interrupted. One of the things that I think corporate America really needs to adjust about is the massive number of meetings and the length of the meetings and what's coming out of the meetings and who's sitting in the meetings that doesn't need to be there or is only there. They're in a one hour meeting for a one minute comment. I think that that's a big killer of the flow state. And I certainly understand the need for communication and coordination and where every business I've started, I have partners in. So I, I'm an over communicator or a try and be, but as a company, we don't have a gazillion meetings every day. We have some, but not like that. And I think that's a big place for people to look at how they can adjust this. I love this phrase that I saw in your work and maybe I'm just silly and I should have seen this sooner, but I saw it in your work. So you get credit in my mind. Hire slow, rent fast. 
Wow. As an entrepreneur who's hired more freelancers in the last 20 years than I care to speak about, and as we all know, especially in the web development space, oh my gosh, these things just happen. I think the whole time now when I look at your work and I look back over the last 20 years, I say to myself, gosh, if I just would have focused on finding the really, really top notch and paying more, I would have been far better off than all the money that I wasted on all the folks that I probably knew from the beginning couldn't do it. And they just were selling me a used car and I knew it and I went along with it. We experience this all the time. Here's the way the conversation often goes. One of our agents presents this fantastic PHP developer who maybe person I'm thinking of has written five books on PHP. He's great. He's not inexpensive. He's not crazy expensive, but he's the high end of the market rates. And let's just say for argument's sake that that's $250 an hour. They come back to us and say, but I went on Upwork or another platform and I see experienced PHP developers for $50 an hour. Aren't they just as good? And the answer is you will find, if you look long enough, you will find a PHP developer for $50 an hour who's fantastic. You will. You're just going to have to try out six, 10 before you get there. By the time you're done with that, you've wasted all this time. You spent all this money. Your product is often a mess. I mean, we have this all the time where people come in with spaghetti code, which is sort of a term for disastrous software engineering code. And you just missed out. You just missed out. The cost, especially when you get into culture, the cost of a bad hire, and this is sort of what we we're talking about with the sabotage impulse, it impacts everybody on the team because they're ducking and covering. It's especially when somebody's in a leadership position who's stealing and taking credit for other people's work, never passing it along. You lose your best people in those situations. So it's not even just the cost of the bad hire. It's the cost to the whole organization. That's the reason that we really encourage people to evaluate when is it appropriate to bring in a freelancer who has expertise, you probably don't need them forever, and when is it appropriate to hire somebody? When you're hiring people, you really have to take your time and you really have to make sure it's the right fit from skills and culture and personality, and not just for the company, but for the team. That's a real skill. I can't imagine the perspective that you have gleaned originally from the music space, and now you say, okay, let's take this mindset of thinking of coding talent as talent, just like we would think of music talent. I just can't imagine that if we have to roll forward one, two, five, 10, 20 years, this trend is not reversing. It's not gonna reverse. There's no way. Everybody's gonna be on an island and whoever works the hardest or figures out the most and puts in the most time, or as you mentioned earlier with Bruce, has this kind of holistic thinking they're going to be the winners. Absolutely. And the problem is there's not going to be a whole lot left but the winners. Where we're going with automation and artificial intelligence, and I'm certainly not the first to say this, but we've been pretty early to be screaming it, along with people like Andrew Yang, who wrote a great book on the topic, jobs are going to be gone for a huge swath of the population. COVID just accelerated everything. I mean, as Andrew said, we just went through 10 years of change in 10 weeks. It's totally true. The numbers that are being reported out of the 43, 44 million people who lost their jobs, 43% are not getting their jobs back. And that wasn't like they're not getting their jobs back this year. They're not getting their jobs back because this is a moment where automation and using technology to replace humans is cheaper and easier. And once you had the people out the door, before you bring them back, you're like, wait, do I need all these people? And what that means is if you're not a 10 x -er or in that neighborhood, the opportunities are going to be fewer and fewer as time goes on. And that begs a lot of big societal questions, which we get into on a website that we built that I encourage people to check out called thedayafterlabor.com, which is all about this problem. And what are we going to do as a society about this problem? Well, you know, it's been a long time building. I mean, I still remember I was living in Northern Virginia, about 15 miles outside Washington, DC. I saw Netscape go public in the summer of 1995. And I said, game on. This is it. This is not going to go backwards. I thought, well, gosh, this is going to be remote work right now. Of course, we just kept building more and more office space. Perhaps we work imploding will be the peak office space moment. What's really interesting still about America is that we still use this term job. And it's really, I think, freelance. If you say someone's freelance, you're not really talking about a job. You're just talking about 
a negotiation, a collaboration with them to where they could help you on something and you help them back. And there's this kind of win-win mentality, whereas a job just feels like you're filling a role. If you leave, you can be replaced. A cog in the machine. Right, right. Clearly, you and I get this because we've been living it a long time. I'm not trying to say we're all that. Maybe you and I just stumbled into it and that's what happened. I'm sure happy that I stumbled into it, but I always just look at situations now. Even when I look at teenagers and I hear stories of teens from families and friends, and it's like they've got this mentality from their 40 something parents we're going to go to college and we're going to study such and such. And I'm like, what kind of horse blinders do you people have on? <laughs> you know? Exactly. Exactly. It's like all the data is there, all the evidence is there. Every major prognosticating institution from all the management consulting firms to all the universities, all predict the same things. Do they predict the same numbers? No. Is it 47% of jobs in the next 15 years that are going to go away or 35%? What difference does it make? I mean, obviously, that's a lot of people in those differentials. The fact of the matter is the world is about to go through a giant gyration, and it's very different than the industrial or agricultural revolution. This isn't just going to be job churn, and you're going to learn something new. There's just not going to be jobs for everybody. And as a society, we're really nowhere in planning for this. And we also, frankly, have to adjust what our values are. Because if we only have a financial measure as values, it's going to make it very hard to advance into the next phase of civilization and society. I don't think a handful of years ago I could have ever considered Andrew Yang's proposal as valid or worthwhile. I would think it's just throwing your hands up and giving up. But I do understand as I get older, I look at this and I say, well, if we do reach a situation where too many people don't have either the aptitude, the skill set, the understanding, whatever the reason is, and they can't adjust, there's going to have to be something. I'm not saying just a very large welfare check for everybody. We are going to reach a point. I think you're making that case. We're going to reach a point where even though you and I might want to have tough love with somebody, we might want to kick them in the butt, you might want to say, hey, you have to work harder. If people go down a certain path long enough, Let's say they do the 18 to 22 college, they go to grad school, they're chasing some job, and now they're 30 years old. In some ways, that's very difficult to escape from mentally and start over. If there's even a place to start over. I mean, I think that a lot of people think, oh, everyone will just learn to code. We won't need that many coders. I mean, we'll need a lot, but it's not like it's going to fill all of the roles. Universal basic income, I think, is a really flawed, it's a concept I'm not excited by at all. But the reason that I sort of entertain it very seriously is, I haven't heard a single alternative that solves the problem. And by the way, it wasn't called this. What does everybody think the added unemployment money was and all of the stimulus money was? It was a form of that. It was a big UBI, wasn't it? <laughs> it was. It was like, a big no UBI. one's saying that. But all of a sudden, Andrew looks like a genius because he was screaming about it for the last two years. He is a super smart guy who really got what was coming. There's still a side of me that wants to hope, pray, et cetera, that people will be able to adjust, that they will be able to have a feeling or a need for something. Because I would think, I would imagine that if we do go to the situation of a UBI for a very large portion of the population, that's going to be psychologically very tough, I think. You're not going to have that sense of meaning and purpose. And that's exactly what we do on the day after labor site is very little of prognosticating and mostly just gathering data so people can educate themselves. The one part that we do is we say, hey, we came from the music industry. We saw the massive disruption in the early part of this century. And that's part of the reason we pivoted or started something new in another industry because we saw this coming. We feel like we have a good vantage point of what it looks like after an industry goes off a cliff. And we have many industries that are about to go off a cliff. We see that the problem is coming, but the problem, we frame it in two ways, which is how do you keep people out of poverty when there's not enough jobs for everyone? That one, at least there's UBI as a potential solution. And the second one, which is equally or maybe even more important, is what do people do with their time, talent, and energy when there's no job for them? And how do they feel fulfilled? And what do they do? And the best thing I've seen is sort of the idea that we would have some credit system, some way of rewarding people for benefiting society, for doing good in the world. But it's barely been proposed. It's barely been discussed. These are things that seem like they're so far out and futuristic. 
that sounds far from freelance. That sounds more like command and control. Oh, yeah. By the way, my take on the freelance economy is this was not the future. This was the rest area on the highway between the employed world we were living in and the unemployed world we're heading toward. We start to see that right now as the freelance economy just took a big hit during this period of time. Some areas did, some areas didn't. We've heard over and over again how people aren't really making a living. They're just sort of stringing together all of these things. And the other thing that happens with the freelance economy is it really throws off the unemployment numbers. I don't mean in this particular moment in time, but even before COVID, you saw these record low unemployment numbers, partly because people had stopped looking for jobs. They were doing, stringing together a little bit of Uber driving and a little bit of task rabbiting and doing all these things to try and stitch together an income, but they were no longer counted on the unemployment rolls because they weren't looking anymore. That made some very misleading numbers. Can I ask you a question on the music space, just to kind of use it as an example, not to drag you back there, but you brought up the notion of how much the industry has changed. And look, there are some billionaires in the space. I forget the one DreamWorks member who's the billionaire. He's basically a billionaire because he owned Fleetwood Mac the and Eagles. Eagles and whatnot. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. David Geffen. Yeah. There's guys out there that were at the right place at the right point in time and whatnot. But have you seen, you're giving the example of how technology has opened up talent for coding, but has technology now after 20 years of Napster direction and you know buying stuff on iTunes and all that stuff and YouTube, has music changed for the better for talent in the sense that can more people actually make a living from it? Explain how it's completely changed. We were at a moment now where streaming revenue was really starting to bring back the music industry or was, had already brought it back to a very robust place and was really filling in the gaps that we lost from CD sales. There was a huge step in the right direction there. COVID, by the way, upended everything because most middle class artists don't make their living from streaming services or sales of music. They make it from touring that is completely shut down and it's really catastrophic for the performers, the road crews, the people who sell popcorn at the venues, everyone, the whole ecosystem. And then the industry is doing better, but I'm actually going to go just a little bit adjacent to talk about sort of what happened as it relates to streaming in film and TV. I'm going to use very broad brushstroke numbers because I don't want to pull them up right now. So I'm going to get this a little bit wrong, but not really wrong. At its height, Blockbuster Video had somewhere in the neighborhood of 60,000 employees and a market cap of, I'm not even going to quote the number. Netflix has roughly 10% of the employees that Blockbuster did at its height and has roughly 10 times or more the valuation. What you see as you make this transition from a physical business to a digital business is you need far fewer people to make far more money. And then you play that out industry after industry, company after company, you start to understand like, why is the world going where it's going? Why is there going to be such a shortage? As soon as you see that, you're like, well, what do I do about this? And the answer is you create an environment where you can have the best people. So you're on the winning side of that. And you create an environment for yourself, both within your company and without, where you can constantly be evolving and improving because the best investment you can make for your future is in you. Keep learning. I love where you guys went in your work because it's quite motivational. And it's one of those things where Maybe if someone's not been exposed to your thinking and how you guys have written your book, maybe they may say, ah, oh, that's pie in the sky or something. But I think if they will just trust a little bit and dive in, they'll kind of walk away with a little bit of an aha moment, maybe a big aha moment. But for those people that kind of already know, I read it and I'm like, oh, it's just one of those sweet reminders, you know, one of those sweet kicks in the rear end where you're kind of like, ah, yes, this is the thinking that I need to remind myself of. There was this whole push and pull that we had in writing the book of, is this a big think book with ideas or is this a practical book that can give you some things to do to really advance yourself? I will admit that we were sort of told you really can't do both. You shouldn't do both. You may not be able to get a deal if you do both. It's challenging to do both of those things. And I think the public will be the judge of this, that we actually did thread that needle in talking about the big ideas and why the world is changing and how it's changing and how that affects you and why you need to be different. And then we actually 
hopefully gave some really good concrete, I mean, that was the intention, ways to actually change your behavior and techniques to be different and techniques to improve. And that's what I'm most excited about. Our whole career is about helping people as a manager or an agent. You're not fulfilling your dream to make money. You're helping other people fulfill their dreams and you get pieces of the pie as a result of that. This isn't about us. This is about how you get where you want to go. Michael, I could probably just pick your mind on all kinds of subjects forever. I'm sure you've got all kinds of interesting tidbits and trivia that we would all kind of go, ooh, that was really in insightful. But I've only got you for so much time. The book, Game Changer, How to Be 10X in the Talent Economy. Everybody can find that anywhere and everywhere, online, buy it at your bookstore, all that kind of fun stuff. Michael, is there a website you want to direct people to? I'm sure there is. It is called GameChangerTheBook.com. And that is where you can find all kinds of info about the book. But there's also some quizzes there that allow you to figure out how 10X are you and how 10X is your company. They're fun. They're easy. It's quick. I think we've got lots of good and interesting info up there. Michael, thank you for taking the time today. I enjoyed it. It was an absolute pleasure. I hope we get to do this again. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.